staying steady. So we can start at any any time, Laura. Yeah, let's kick it off. All let's right. Um, so, okay. Hi everyone and welcome to our rain garden workshop, Rain, Rain, Go Away, Building Rain Gardens in New York City. Next slide. We are Grow NYC, we protect the environment, create green spaces, help people stay healthy, and give them opportunities to make a positive impact. I'm Laura Casaragola. I'm a school gardens coordinator with Grow NYC. As part of our program, any DOE K through 12 public or charter school in New York City can reach out to us and we can provide you with support as you start or maintain a school garden or outdoor learning space. Uh, you'll see a lot of other people um, with their videos on today who are my colleagues here. So we have DK Kennard um, from the School Gardens Community Gardens team. We have Jinky Nogales, who is a fellow School Gardens coordinator for the Bronx and Upper Manhattan. Spencer Harbo is here and Lars from our Green Space program at Grow NYC. And Rowey is also here as a special guest from the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, who's gonna tell you about their program and how you can get involved in rain gardens. So we have a lot uh, uh, on the agenda today. So let's get started. In today's workshop, we're in a webinar, so you can um, submit your questions using the Q&A function, which is at your toolbar in the bottom of your screen. And we're, we wanna leave plenty of time for questions today. So um, as they come up, you can still chat and have conversations in the chat, but if you have a question that you do want us to get to, make sure it goes in the Q&A. Um, we're recording today and we will send you a follow-up email that contains the recording, as well as a lot of great follow-up resources. And all of that can be found anytime on our distance learning site, grownycdistancelearning.org. So the agenda for today is to first learn the basics of what a rain garden is and what are its uses. Then we're gonna hear from Rowie from DEP about rain garden stewardship in New York City and how you can become part of the Harbor Protectors Program with DEP. We'll then go into more of the specifics of how to build and maintain a rain garden, whether it's at your school, community, home, someone mentioned at their place of work, they might wanna build one. Uh, we'll look at different plant selections and choices. And finally, um, for our educators in the audience and school gardeners, we'll throw out some ideas of how you can use rain gardens as teaching tools with students. All right, so why is it important to have rain gardens in New York City? Rain gardens are shallow depressions that soak up water, such as runoff stormwater, and they use native plants that can tolerate both wet and dry conditions. They also provide an important habitat for pollinators and birds, and they prevent soil erosion. Um, so let's go into the next slide where you can see an example of uh, one of the rain gardens um, on a New York City street. So they, they have so many uses. Um, one of the biggest reasons they've been implemented on the streets in New York City is because they help prevent rainwater and stormwater runoff from entering the city's sewer system and overloading the combined sewer overflow. Um, so a CSO or combined sewer overflow occurs when water treatment plants are bombarded by so much stormwater uh, that it combines with untreated sewage and gets discharged directly into the city's waterways because the system just can't handle so much water. So these rain gardens can actually absorb that water and help prevent the treatment plants from getting overwhelmed. In addition to absorbing water, the rain gardens also store, soak, and filter pollutants. They also beautify the neighborhood as does any green space, um, and they reduce the temperatures during hot weather, especially if trees are included. Um, they purify the air and they help with street ponding and flood control as New York City faces uh, larger rain events from climate changes. So this is a nice cross-section diagram of a rain garden. So you usually are only seeing them from the top but this is what it looks like underneath the ground. 
So notice that it's not leveled. Most traditional gardens, you want kind of that, that level uh, soil. But for a rain garden, you want it to dip down like a bowl so that the water will actually stream into it. You can see the very bottom layer is gravel and that is for drainage and it helps the water percolate into the ground. In between this gravel and the soil, there's generally a piece of landscape fabric in between them. And that's so that the soil doesn't fall into the gravel. It kind of keeps the gravel and the soil separate. And then you can see we have plants here that have very deep roots. Um, so they soak up the water and keep the soil in place. And we'll go further into depth about plant selection later in the presentation. Um, something else, a feature of a rain garden is that they are designed to drain in 48 hours or less. And this is helpful because, um, helpful to note, because standing water, you might think that could become a mosquito breeding ground, but um, if your rain garden is draining properly within 48 hours, you don't have to worry about mosquitoes because the larva needs 72 hours minimum to develop. So rain gardens should not be attracting mosquitoes if maintained and draining properly. All right, let's go to the next slide and I'll turn it over to Rowie in just a moment. Um, but yeah, we wanted to invite DEP, Department of Environmental Protection here today um, so that they can share how you can become a rain garden volunteer steward for street gardens and a lot of other ways to get involved. So this is a great option if you don't have your own growing space or if you wanna do it for educational purposes to learn more about it. Um, and if you want a cool way to volunteer around the city. So we can go to the next slide and Roe, feel free to take it away. Thank you so much, Laura and Grow NYC. So hi everyone, I'm Rowie. I represent the Rain Garden Maintenance Unit over at DEP as a community coordinator. So for folks interested in helping care for nearby rain gardens that are already constructed and set up within New York City, DEP offers a volunteer program called Harbor Protectors. And so the program offers opportunities for community members to help DEP manage stormwater in a more sustainable and meaningful way, which is important for keeping our harbor ways and, and waterways clean. Um, community members can become harbor protectors by catch basin cleanup, catch basin stenciling, which is writing messages um, about awareness about where what flows into the waterway through catch basins rain garden care, and also you can participate in shoreline cleanup events. With rain garden specifically, and you can see an example in the picture, in the larger picture here, um, they may look like tree pits, but you could tell that it's a rain garden um, with the inlet, the curb cut out um, by the curb, which allows storm water to flow in. Specifically for them to work effectively, these systems need regular maintenance in many ways, just like a regular garden um, in a public setting. Uh, plants need regular care, trash and debris need to be removed. There are also other added components with a rain garden um, so that it that, that need maintenance so that it can function as designed, like clearing the inlet to allow the rain garden to convey stormwater. As a, as a harbor protector, you can provide extra help to keep the rain gardens looking good and functioning well between visits from city staff. So our staff visits rain gardens on a regular basis for maintenance, but since there's thousands of them in New York City, um, a lot of the times they, they focus on, on the basis of removing trash. So extra eyes from the community to help on checking on Horticulture care was huge and a much appreciated help. So you can join Harbor Protectors as an individual on your own time, as a community group, or you could also help by hosting volunteer events within our community. Um, DEP offers support by providing training, resources, supplies, equipment, um, and education materials too. And we can come out and help support in any way if you wanted to produce an event within your community. If you'd like to know where the rain gardens are within 
your area, you can visit nyc.gov slash DEP slash GI map. And it doesn't just show rain gardens within New York City, it also shows all types of green infrastructure assets that are nearby within you. So check it out, it's a cool resource. Um, if you have any specific question about the program or if you have an idea for any community collaboration you'd like to do, please reach out. Um, specifically, if you're an educator within New York City um, and you're hoping to implement rain garden education in your school and you're near, nearby some public rain gardens, do reach out because we're starting to implement a rain garden education program. And we'd love to hear any of any interest or feedback. Otherwise, um, to learn more about the Harbor Protectors program, please visit nyc.gov slash harbor protectors. Thank you. Amazing, thank you so much. Uh, it's a really exciting and cool program. Um, and Rowie will be here for the rest of the workshop. So if you have more questions um, for her at the end, we she'll be there to answer any of your questions too. All right, so now we'll go into how to build your own rain garden. And in the next slide, we'll see a photo of uh, Lars from Grow NYC building a rain garden at the Riverside Valley Community Garden in Harlem. So Lars, would you wanna jump in and just explain a little bit of what you're doing in this photo and how it's all coming together? You are muted. This is a rain garden that uh, Spencer and I built at the bottom of a slope in, um, uh, what's it called? Riverside Park Garden? Riverside, Riverside Valley Community Valley, Garden. Riverside Valley Garden, 138th Street, um, north of 108th, 138th Street, um, Riverside Park. Um, there's a, um, it's hard to see, everything looks pretty flat here in the picture and, the, and photographs will do that. But um, there's a slope um, 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 that would be up in front of me, water runs down that slope. And um, on the other side of that screen right there um, is the, um, the Amtrak, the, tr the Amtrak track train. Um, you can kind of see gravel almost through the uh, screen there and the tracks are there. Um, so, um, this rain garden is installed to prevent uh, storm water that, that runs down the slope um, um, toward us from the picture, um, from mm, washing down, running onto the tracks and to retain that water. And we also built it sort of as a, a pollinator garden. You can see we have a variety of uh, grasses back in here, but also some uh, flowering plants that attract pollinators and um, with um, rain gardens and bioswales, that is often um, a nice planting strategy um, because many um, flowering plants that pollinators like are applicable for rain garden applications. So what we have here, um, um, we've excavated this, um, um, a trench um, along a pathway and in front of the train, train tracks and um, there's you know, soil that has been dug out. You can see it all mounded up in front of where my feet are and all along there. And we've dug that out to a depth and, it, and you can see where I'm standing. Well, it's deeper than it looks like in the picture because, all, because the depth of all those plants that are behind me, those are gonna fit into that trench and will be able to be covered and it's still going to be a low area. Um, the, the, the depth of the uh, gravel that we're putting in is probably about 10 inches, something like that, 10 inches of gravel. Um, um, I think the, we have another picture of it finished, but what's, what will happen next is that once that, you can see I'm grading and raking out the gravel there. Um, once that's, that gravel is graded, we'll put a piece of filter fabric, landscape fabric on top of that. Um, as Laura said in the diagram that we looked at a little while ago, that, that fabric keeps the soil from moving downward into the gravel. And because you want the gravel to remain free of soil um, so that water can move freely through it and, and be discharged down below into the water table eventually. 
Um, if it becomes all clogged, if the gravel becomes clogged with soil, water doesn't move uh, through the gravel mm, nearly as well. Um, so a, a layer of fabric will go on top of that. We then will place those plants um, um, in a beautiful planting scheme into the uh, uh, the the uh, on top of the uh, fabric, and then and then return all of that soil that's been dug up to around to around the plants, grade it off, and then um, put in um, and then put down a layer of mulch to help retain um, moisture and to keep the um, 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 plant roots plant roots happy well, when it's when it's not raining because probably this this doesn't get watered too much. Um, I don't know, I could go on and on, um, but uh, let's <laughs> on to the next slide. And um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so here it is. Um, it's been, uh, it's been planted out and we've uh, returned, we've, uh, we've mulched the surface with about, um, oh, two inches, three inches of, um, of, of mulch. And then um, along this border, we've placed a bunch of old tree trunk things that kind of, this helps to retain the pathway a bit. Some, some tree pieces that we found, that's what you're seeing along the edge there. Maybe some of them are stone. I think most of them are wood, but um, um, yeah, there you go. And it's planted out, you can see mostly in um, a variety of, well, about half of the plants are large grasses. Uh, um, and then a variety of um, flowering stuff that um, does well in, in, in soil conditions like this. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so in the next slide, you'll see the instructions, basically everything that Lars just explained, um, excavating the garden area, adding the gravel, placing the landscape fabric, um, filling with, with the soil and the plants, adding a border around it using logs, sometimes compost filter socks are used or something just to keep it all contained. Um, and then mulching it on the top, which uh, protects the newly planted garden, prevents weeds and helps keep everything in place. And then in the next slide, so that's building it. And now we wanted to mention a little bit of the maintenance that goes into a rain garden. And generally, the beautiful thing about rain gardens is that they are low maintenance. Uh, the only time they'll require a bit more of a, a regular maintenance schedule is in the first year, maybe a little bit in the second year as well, because um, they are still getting established. So you do need to do weekly weeding and watering for the first year, just as those um, native plants that you put in are establishing themselves, outgrowing the weeds and um, really filling into their potential there. So the first year you should expect to be doing that maintenance, but then for the following years, you really only have to be working in there um, once in the spring to prune back some things and add a new layer of uh, mulch. But generally you, they're low maintenance after that first year. Um, during the first year, you also wanna keep a close eye on it and observe it during rain events. So you wanna make sure that it is actually the water is infiltrating within 24 to 48 hours. So whenever there's a big storm, you wanna get out there. This is a great thing to do with students if you're at a school is to go and measure the level of water and make sure that it's infiltrating properly. And if it's not, then you'll have to do some troubleshooting, um, adding different elements to the garden to make sure that it's functioning the way it's meant to. This particular rain garden that you see is a really impressive one that we've built. It's out on Governor's Island at our um, at our teaching garden um, on Governor's Island, the Grow NYC teaching garden. This absorbs an enormous amount of um, street runoff and flooding, which happens on that particular roadway. Well, it used to happen on that roadway each time it rained. This garden absorbs an enormous amount of water in each in each rain and and um and and solved a real problem that we had on that site with flooding um, um as when we were first working with that site um, um a very successful uh bioswale rain garden um this particular one yeah and um since you just did use the word bioswale and i saw someone in the q a asked a question if our rain gardens the same as swales or bioswales and we're using those terms interchangeably. 
I think if you're being a real like engineering terms, bioswale might have some technical differences, but we are using them interchangeably. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide and look at some different plant selections that you can choose. Um, so I, I wanted to bring back this cross-section diagram because it's so such a useful visual. Um, the best plants for rain gardens are those that are happy with a drought and drench lifestyle. So they, that means they need to be tolerant of wet conditions when it rains a lot and they have to be okay with sitting in that standing water for you know, a day or two. Um, but you also want them to be tolerant of dry spells because you don't want to have to be out there watering them every week when it doesn't rain. So that's why native plants are highly recommended because they are uniquely adapted to our local weather patterns and fluctuations. Um, you'll also notice you might want to place your most uh, like swampy marshy plants right here in the in the middle, which is where they'll be sitting in the water for the longest. Um, all right, so let's go on to the next slide. And there are three general classifications of plants for rain gardens. Um, so we have uh, herbaceous plants, which are going to include your flowers, grasses, sedges, and ferns. Um, another class would be woody shrubs. And then there's also trees. Um, I'll, I've just been mentioning trees, but I'm not going to go into them very much in depth. Uh, you'll see trees at a lot of the DEP rain gardens um, on New York City streets. But for home rain gardens or ones that you're building yourself, uh, a lot of times it will just have the herbaceous plants and the woody shrubs because they're a bit easier for to maintain and get situated into your garden. All right, so on the next slide, um, I'm not going to go super into depth on every single plant. I wanted to point out that everything I'm about to mention, I pulled off of the Brooklyn Botanic Garden plant list. They have a huge comprehensive list of great plant choices, specifically for rain gardens in a New York City surrounding areas climate. So don't feel like you have to like screenshot any of the, the list of plants that are about to come up. You can just, well, you'll give, get this link um, in our follow-up email and you can explore all of the, the many plant choices. But I did want to give you a sampling. So on the next slide, you'll see a lot. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the Latin names, uh, <laughs> but we have, um, if your rain garden is going to be situated in a sunny area, these are some great flowers. So uh, you'll see in this one picture, that's a blue flag iris, which is extremely water tolerant. They can actually grow in, I, I got this photo from the Prospect Park Lake. So they can grow in water, in marshy areas, and they're a native plant that is really tolerant to conditions like that. Moving on, we have uh, some options of flowers. If your rain garden is in a shady area, so maybe it's, it's blocked by buildings or maybe there's a lot of trees around, so you don't get a lot of sun, but you can still have a rain garden and you just plant appropriately for that. So in this photo, um, as part of this list, we have Joe Pieweed which is also a native plant that pollinators, as you can see, they love this flower. So those are some plant options for that. Up next, um, these are some examples of grasses and sedges that you can do in sunny rain gardens. So we have some native sedges there. And then up next we have uh, for shady rain gardens, uh, ferns are great to incorporate. And I think for rain gardens, it's, it's nice to have a mix of flowers, grasses, sedges, ferns. Um, if you want that plant biodiversity, one, it looks really beautiful to have all that diversity in there. And it's also good for the environment to have a lot of different plant varieties. Um, and then lastly, just wanted to give you some ideas for woody native shrubs. And so these ones, these plants will probably grow to be a bit larger than some of the other ones we mentioned so far. So it's nice to incorporate a couple of native shrubs into your rain gardens as well. And so once again, you'll have the list. You don't need to remember all the different varieties of gray 
dogwood trees <laughs> to plant. Um, so let's let's move on to our last our last little section before we move on to the Q and A. Uh, rain gardens as teaching tools. Um, so I just wanted to throw in some ideas for our educators in the audience for how rain gardens can tie into curriculum. They provide such great hands-on project-based, location-based learning um, that really connects students to their natural environment as well as their local community, their local ecosystem, um, and their neighborhoods. So some ideas for how it can tie into curriculum. Uh, you can learn, use rain gardens to learn about the water cycle, the watershed, local weather, um, climate change and climate resilience. You can learn about green infrastructure, um, as well as engage in local politics, volunteering and activism for your neighborhood. An insect and pollinator education. Of course, yes. Place in these. Definitely. All right, so we do have a lot of resources. Uh, this next slide just has some of them that these are some of the links where we got information for this workshop. We have even more. We'll also send you our Grow NYC rainwater harvesting guide. Uh, we didn't even you know, talk that much today about how to harvest your own rainwater using rain barrels or things like that. But if you're interested in, in rainwater harvesting, there's different structures and ways you can do that. So we'll also want to follow up with you with some information about that as well. Um, next, this is another link that I'll, I'll send you. Um, it's a great video of one of those tree pit rain gardens being built in New York City, which is uh, super interesting and cool to watch it happen. And that brings us to our Q&A sec section. So DK, I will turn it over to you uh, to pose questions. Um, I'm here to answer, but we also have you know, Lars Spencer from Green Space, who have built a lot of rain gardens, and Rowie from DEP. So feel free to throw your questions in the Q&A, and what we're happy to all answer. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. We've got some really great questions. We will do our best to get to as many questions as possible. But in the event that we are not able to, we really do welcome you to contact us at School Gardens at Grow and We grownyc.org, and that address will be listed at the end of our presentation as well. I want to jump in with a really great question specifically for Lars. Lars, why doesn't the planting in your rain garden go all the way to the edging? We can go back to that slide as well, Jinky. Lars, can you come off mute for us, please, so we can hear your robust information? <laughs> I guess in the in this um, in this one, it could have gone all the way to the edging. Um, the pathway, uh, so the pathway is to the right hand side of these logs here. Um, now it's been a, it's been two years since since uh, installing this one. Um, the planting could go could go um, another. Yeah, it could, could come all the way up to the edging here. It could be planted out. It's just that what we have here, we've planted directly on top of where we, where we installed the, um, um, the gravel layer. Um, so, when, so when constructing this one, we dug the soil out and the soil sat on top of this area that, that, um, um that you're that you're asking about you know you know whether the garden could have now yeah we could have dug it out wider we could have installed a wider garden i guess i guess um what i would say is that what you're seeing is that the plantings here are right on top of where we've got filter fabric and gravel um underneath certainly the the area um to the right of it could be planted out in, the, in, in similar types of plants. And uh, as these plants mature and grow, some of them will actually will, will spread into that area. Um, other plants could be put, uh, could be put in this area. Um, bulbs could be put in there. 
it'll, this area, the, the area to the right would remain a little bit more dry than the area behind it. It's a little bit higher, um, but um, it's a good question. And, and, and we could have uh, made the garden wide, made it wider, or we could have placed those um, retaining logs further to the left and made the pathway wider. This is just how this is just how it ended up right at the end of our of our of our construction. And probably since then, in the last two years, gardeners have planted stuff in there. I think also to add to that, also to add to that, Lars, um, we were keeping in mind that the rain garden is along the edge of a path. So to prohibit any of the plants from growing over into the path and causing a, you know, a maintenance concern for the garden members who use the pathway pretty frequently. I think that's, that's another consideration to keep in mind, you know, what are the edges of your rain garden or swale and how can you accommodate plants within that area that doesn't overflow into other areas of your garden or wherever you're planting. Yeah, especially with these, these larger, some of these are, are, are fairly large grasses now and they'll become quite large grasses, these particular clump grasses. Um, so it makes sense for them to be back away from that edge a little bit. Thank you, Lars and Spencer. Wow, our Q&A is really lighting up. I want to jump into this next one. This is for anyone on the panel, and this is a really excellent point. Are there any tips for anyone who is, is trying to recover their backyard or their garden space and convert it into a rain garden and the space has suffered from significant flood damage. Well, if your backyard, um, if you're getting flood damage in your backyard, meaning, uh, uh, I, I think that with each particular site like this, um, there would be a, a slightly different answer for each um, for each site or each condition, but. If you're, if, if for example, your downspout, your 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 leader coming from your roof is flowing into the backyard and not being directed straight into a sewer system, if it's flowing into the backyard, water from the roof is then um, ponding um, um, in the back in the backyard. If it's if it's a building here in New York City and your backyard is small. Um, it would depend on the soil grade um, um, in that in that area. In order to create a rain garden, just generally, what you'd want to do in a in a condition like that is to somehow create a lower area back toward the rear toward the rear of the lot, away from the building, so that so that when water is discharged down into the um, water table through a rain garden, it's done so away from the building. So in order to create a rain garden and kind of recover a backyard like that, I would just not having, not seeing the site, what I would say is that most likely you're going to want to dig soil from the rear of the lot it, 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 with wheelbarrows, bring it toward the building and raise the so raise the soil grade where it's closer to the building. That's good for a building to have a higher soil grade near the building that sheds water away from the building's foundation, which is always good. Um, so then, so then removing soil from the rear of the yard, bringing it toward the building, creating a grade so that it slopes toward a lower area at the rear of the um, yard. And then at that point, digging down, um, um, installing gravel in that rear area, then filter fabric, then using some of that soil to, um, that you've dug out to fill back in around your plants, adding um, compost, um, um, organic material to create a rich soil back there that will, where, where plants will, will want to grow. Um, and it's possible in some conditions like this, some of that soil in the rear yard may need to actually be removed, taken out through the building or whatever to, uh, to um, but, but, but in certain conditions, the whole grade of the yard would need to be 
corrected in 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 in, uh, in some way. But again, not having not seeing the site, the specific site, uh, that's about the best I can do with that. Yeah, and I'll add. I saw that uh, the person who asked that question. This was because of Ida. They had the the terrible flooding, and I just I'll just share. Um, my bathroom flooded so horribly during Ida. And that was part of my reason for wanting to even like learn more about rain gardens and put on this workshop because um, yeah, it's, it's one of the solutions for all of the rampant flooding that's happening in New York City. If your bathroom was flooding or basement during Ida, um, if that water was come, uh, some of the water, now this happened to a- I know, I don't think the rain garden would fix my bathroom flooding. Um, <laughs> oh, well, one one way that it could fix it is if you are sending all of your water down the storm sewer in that building and the storm sewer is becoming overwhelmed, then that water could back up into your bathroom that is trying to get off your roof and down through. So if that water were being channeled into a low area in the backyard, this is a possible way that it could that it could avoid sewer backup like that. Basically, when that happens, you're having a combined sewer overflow event right in your building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rowie, can you talk to us, please, a little bit more about harbor protectors and when are some opportunities for volunteer events and how we can learn more about that? Um, I saw a question about the next volunteer event for Harbor Protectors. Um, there's no public date on, just set on the calendar yet, though um, people are talking and planning around Earth Day, Earth Month. So um, when we hammer the results down, uh, the, the final dates down, um, we'll, we'll put it on the Harbor Protectors listserv. So when you visit nyc.gov slash Harbor Protectors, there's a link to sign up as a Harbor Protector and that would put you on a listserv um, to find out more about upcoming events. Um, if you are part of a community group or uh, represent a local organization and would like to put out your own event, um, please do reach out. You could put it in the interest form as well. And if you're just representing yourself or a local community group, you could also um, organize together and care for a nearby rain garden um, uh, on your own time, whenever um, it, it's all on your schedule as well. Um, and we can come out and uh, I'll provide some of the plantings. Um, we can provide equipment as well, um, any kind of troubleshooting or help or insight you need. Um, you, you could all, you could find some videos as well on that, that website, nyc.gov slash harbor protectors. This is a question that affects many, if not all of us, something that we are all dealing with on a regular basis, the bane of my personal existence. How do we keep rats at bay in our rain garden? Panel, take it away. Well, um, you see that in the rain garden that we that we showed in the example, it has those wooden logs as its border. Um, one thing, the best way to keep rats at bay in a rain garden is not to provide um, shelter things that they could shelter under in the garden. So, in this particular um, example. Uh, rats could burrow underneath of these logs, right? And they could find shelter there. Um, a lot of times rain gardens look, it looks great to have um, large rocks or something. If you find large rocks um, 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 what, um, that, that are on site or you've got a, some rocks, putting those rocks there looks great. That potentially provides a place where rats could burrow under uh, and uh, um, um, so uh, another difficulty in the city is that is that um, um, a lot of times just underground there's a lot of rubble smashed old smashed buildings are down there often and um, 
um, probably not in most people's backyards, but certainly in community gardens, um, almost all of them contain a lot of rubble underground. That, the, the, that provides places where rats can dig and get established and become happy because they've got shelter. Um, so the, the really the, 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 the best thing that will deter rats is to do all that you can to not provide anywhere that they can shelter underneath of. Um, um, so um, if you've got, if, you, if, you're, if you're building in an area where you have rat problems, maybe avoid using border logs and rocks and things like that at first. And if you see the rats do start to dig, um, um, make them really work at it and, and deny them shelter. Fill their rocks with, or fill their holes with pea gravel or sand or something that as they dig, it will cave in. And, and so you've got to make them work and expend energy um, in order to, 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 to be in that area of your, of your garden. If the rats have to work too, if, if every time the rat digs a hole, the very next day you come out and fill it up with pea gravel or sand, eventually they're gonna, they're gonna decide that it just takes too much energy to dig here and they're gonna move somewhere else. But that takes about a month or so at least of uh, continuous uh, vigilance. Yeah, and I'll add um, another basic rat mitigation strategy is to make sure that there's no food or trash that they can get to that's within like 100 feet or so, because um, they, they need to live somewhere where they can get fats and proteins. So if, you're, if you see that the trash is being left out near your garden, then the rats are going to be like, this is great. I have a place to sleep and live, and I have a place to eat. Um, and so if you can remove the, the trash or any type of food or make sure your compost uh, doesn't have any fats or proteins in it, that will also be a deterrent for rats to take up residence in your garden. And I posted, if you wanna watch a virtual workshop we did uh, last year on rat mitigation in gardens, I put the link in the chat. Thank you so much for all of these wonderful questions. We do have time for a few more questions. And if we are not able to get to your question today, please, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at schoolgardens at grownyc.org. Again, that email address will be posted at the end of our presentation. I would like to shift our conversation just a little bit to talk about rain barrels. There's a question regarding there are organizations and or local officials that will provide free rain barrels. Can we talk a little bit about rain barrels and any suggestions of how we might obtain them or acquire them? Do you know, Roe, does DEP do a rain barrel give, not, 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 not now, right? A rain, rain barrel pro, giveaway program? There is a program. I'm trying to look up um, exactly the, the website on the DEP, um, just about information. I know that it's through the local um, organizations that they're provided through. So um, I, I'm sorry, I don't really know exactly who or where you would get that information from. Oh, um, I see in the chat that Robin has provided a website. Um, We'll also follow up with the additional um, information and the follow up with um, okay. resources on where to get a green barrel. Um, thank you, Robin, for putting that link in the chat. And in the past, um, organizations like Grow NYC and NYC Parks Green Thumb have also gotten rain barrels to give away to community members. Um, which hasn't happened in the past couple of years, just because of the pandemic, but I, I imagine that program would also ramp up through our organization and NYC Parks. Um, so you could also reach out to Grow NYC to see um, how we could provide rain barrels. Another great question is in effort to perhaps repurpose space, is there any way to redo a tree pit and turn that into a rain garden? 
Um, so within the right of way, which is the, the public space, so um, on the sidewalks, the roads, um, there is uh, a series of criteria in selecting where a rain garden would be in the public right of way. Um, so while some tree pits may have been converted into a right of way rain garden, um, there could possibly be other um, ways that it's not able to turn into a rain garden. So um, there's a majority of rain gardens within Queens, Brooklyn, and some in the Bronx, but not so much in, let's say, Manhattan. And it's because there's a lot of competition um, with utility underground. And so Manhattan is just a little more developed. Um, it's um, been settled in earlier. So there's just a lot of things going underground. Um, besides existing infrastructure and utility underground, um, there's also bedrock. And so if it's uh, a little more shallow, it, rain gardens wouldn't be able to be there even if there's a, a tree pit because it has to go a little further down. So um, the bedrock is a little higher in the ground. It'll just end up being just like a little tub so um the it's a long-winded answer to say um not all tree pits can turn into a rain garden because of how it's constructed and what's underground thank you for that oh, here's I'll, another also, sorry oh, sure <laughs> oh, please also, go ahead absolutely i'll also add um that that map link um that uh i shared you could see not only existing rain gardens that are within um, New York City, but you could also, it's color coded to see where they're citing and considering where to place right of way rain gardens and also um, rain gardens that are in construction are being developed. So you could see um, where contracts are in place where rain gardens might be um, coming soon in your neighborhood. You can Thank also, you, think, you can kind of think of any tree pit though as a rain garden. Um, Anyway, um, even if it, it um, so, even though it doesn't have a cut to the curb as the as the rain garden uh, that we're seeing in the picture does, where it's cut and so street water runs into the tree pit, you could think of a of a, of any tree pit as a rain garden because it's absorbing the the um, sidewalk runoff that is above it, um, and in order to um, help both the tree and the health of the soil in the tree pit um, to keep that soil um, just a little bit below sidewalk grade, not too much, but a little bit so that so that when water runs down the sidewalk, it doesn't run off of the, um, away from the tree roots and, and off into the street, but instead the, um, the tree pit is slightly concave around the tree so that, um, so that sidewalk runoff feeds the tree, helps plants that are in the um, tree pit, which also helps the tree um, and helps the soil conditions um, um, in that tree pit. Um, so in a way, you can kind of think of a tree pit or sort of any planted area as a rain garden. I want to close this out. I think we have time for one or two more questions, but I do want to get to this one because this is a really good one for any one of our panelists that would like to answer. What is the ideal landscape and or soil space to which we should build a rain garden? What are, what are some things that we should look for when we're looking for a rain garden site? What are some things that we should shy away from? What are some, some red flags, if you will, and areas that maybe we shouldn't? try to build a rain garden? Great question. Um, look for, um, um, if you've got a, um, a, a community garden, let's say, or a backyard, um, um, think about um, installing the rain garden in the lowest, in the lowest area um, um, first. That will make it, well, the, 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 that, that's where the water will want to go from the site uh, and um, uh, it'll require less digging. <laughs> um, while I represent like just the right of way rain gardens, um, it, it is just 
finding out, looking at where the water channels to and where it wants to go. But I think the, the beauty about rain gardens is that for me, I don't encourage anyone to, we have specific rain gardens that um, do well with um, liking their feet wet. And we don't encourage anyone to put in, let's say, plants for, for consumption. And so I, I think there's more opportunity to have a planted space because um, these rain gardens are there to help um, the local ecosystem and not in the way of creating little mini farms. And so um, choosing the right soil, I think it's, it's less um, stringent than, than let's say growing a, a planting bed for, for growing food. So in a way it's, it's more wiggle room with creating a rain garden. Lars and Spencer, will you talk a little bit about filter fabrics and the best fabric fabrics to use in your rain gardens? Yeah. Um, um, so there are different uh, thicknesses, different grades of, uh, of filter fabric. Um, if you are shopping at uh, hardware store, you're going to find a thinner um, material probably that is that is going to be not quite as durable as, um, um, but but probably durable enough, but not as durable as um, as stuff that you would source from a from a um, um, a, a landscape supplier. Um, the the depending on how much fabric um, you wanted to use, um, uh, I don't know that a really durable fabric can be purchased in small amounts. That's generally in rolls that are, we usually get it in rolls that are 100 feet long and um, anywhere between four and usually six feet wide, but it could be as wide as eight feet wide. That's a woven polyester material with a, um, um, I'm not really a fabric expert, but it's a woven material that has a um, um, kind of a fuzzy uh, reverse side to it, really tough stuff. Um, but for most applications, you probably don't need as durable a fabric as that. Probably the, 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 gray color usually they are fabrics that you can source from Lowe's or Home Depot or other hardware stores are um, are just fine all they need to do they they because because once they're buried once they're in place on top of the gravel and the soil is on them even though they may seem a little bit flimsy when you're installing them once they're installed and in place they become pretty durable and you know that because if you start you take your shovel and you try to dig through the stuff even the the thin stuff is going to be pretty, uh, pretty tough. Um, anything else, Spencer, that you can think of uh, regarding fabric choice? Um, um. No, nothing else that I can think of. I, I think you know anything is um, any kind of screen is going to be better than no screen as far as separating the soil from the crushed stone or gravel or whatever you're using as a infiltration layer. Um, but yeah, I would, um, you know, recommend using what what's locally available and is what is, you know, within your budget for your project. I saw related to that question, someone also asked if there's a lifetime, um, like what's the lifetime of the landscape fabric? Will you have to go in and dig everything up to replace it at some oh. point? Unfortunately, the landscape, and that is, uh, that is one of the negative uh, um, aspects of landscape fabric, in my opinion, is that it lasts a super long time, and it is plastic. Um, so it's basically burying plastic in the ground. Um, there are applications like when you're trying to separate soil from crushed stone or gravel in a rain garden where it's necessary. Um, there are other, there are, uh, um, you know, 
I, I, I work in a lot of community gardens around the city and I encounter conditions where I'll be digging and I'll want to plant something and run into fabric that's been there 20, 30 years. And that stuff is as tough as the day it was installed. It, you know, it creates a plastic barrier that um, worm, earthworms can't pass through very easily. Tree roots can't pass through very easily. It creates compaction conditions underneath of the fabric. So we have in recent years have really been starting to look at the use of landscape fabric uh, because uh, in the past we've used it for a whole lot of things and it is great for some applications underneath of pathways, for example, where you don't want weeds to come up through the pathway. Um, but when thinking about it as a weed barrier, um, it's like, oh, put down fabric and this will stop the weeds from growing in the garden. It will do that initially, but eventually the weeds will establish themselves in the fabric and become more difficult to remove. Plus, you've got plastic fabric in the ground that lasts a super long time. So, so there is no maintenance as far as the, the, um, the, the rain gardens that we built, once that fabric's in, they'll never have to be excavated and the fabric replaced. No, but, um, but, but I, I, I am really starting to think about um, us being much more careful about the use of fabric um, um, for a lot of other um, types of applications. Um, and, I don't know. That's a whole thing. I, I, I could I could talk for a long time on that too, but I'll stop there. Um. Yeah, that's it. Definitely, it has its pros and cons. Yeah. Um, so it is five o'clock. We want to be uh, respectful of everyone's time. Thank you so much for joining us today. As DK says in the chat, the conversation doesn't end here. You can reach out to us at our email address if you have follow-up questions. And we also hope to see you at our upcoming virtual workshops. So I posted our Eventbrite link in the chat as well. So if you wanna just sign up for those, um, we'll see you at the next one. We have a seed starting workshop on March 9th, uh, a nutrition ed for middle school uh, educators on March 17th, if that applies to you. And then if you are New York City public or charter school, we're gonna have a drop in hour as well on March 22nd. And we have more workshops to come um, that we'll be posting shortly. So sign up on Eventbrite. And then on the next slide, you'll see our email if you need us for anything. Thank you all so much. And thank you to Rowie from DEP and all of our, our guests today for sharing your knowledge. Thanks everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a great afternoon.